Hi everyone, uh, I'm going to talk about some Java under the hood today, but first a couple of words about myself. I'm a software engineer originally coming from Ukraine and uh, I live in the Netherlands and work at Xibia as a consultant and I'm really curious about everything related to Java and JVM and how things work under the hood. And I'm going to go into the bytecodes and everything and maybe a bit deeper, but first let me give you some um, context just to yeah just to get up to speed so uh when you write a program in any language on top of the jvm like java kotlin scala they get compiled with their own compilers obviously and they get translated into a, a format that is very standard for all of them um yeah it, actually there is something uh, less standard but okay um and this format uh this becomes a bytecode that is written into a class file. And uh, then the only thing is that this class file should correspond to some specific requirements that JVM has. JVM will carefully check that everything is exactly to spec and uh, it will be rejected if something is wrong. And if everything is okay, then it will be executed. And it seems like a really smart idea to have this, this environment where you can run you can build so many different languages on top of the JVM. You have the standard bytecode, and all you need to do is translate from any language you like into this bytecode, and then it will be just hosted on the JVM. It's a really smart design to have this, yeah, to have this uh, in mind. But actually, it was not um, designed with this in mind from the start. Originally, JVM was built specifically to host one language, and it is Java, and of course, because Java has some ideology, uh, JVM also had some limitations because of this ideology. So, for example, Java is a statically typed language. So that means that uh, during compile time, the code gets checked that all the types and everything, it has to be strictly verified. And everything, uh, and if something is wrong in the bytecode, it will be rejected during compile time, even before it reaches the JVM and gets to run there. And that guarantees that during runtime, there will be minimum surprises uh, if something funky happened with the types, etc. There are also dynamically typed languages where in the code there might be no types mentioned at all. And they are not checked at compile time or whatever, but during runtime, there might be situations that, okay, we check that the uh, uh, values that we have actually have the types that are expected and yeah if something is wrong then it will crash at runtime just uh, yeah it might seem that then it is probably impossible to build a dynamically typed language on top of the JVM because JVM wants everything checked at compile time and everything should be strict right uh, actually uh, there are a couple of dynamically typed languages there are more and uh, these are just some examples and yeah, they had to deal with some challenges. For example, this is a valid piece of code um, in Python. And imagine you would like to have uh, this kind of code running on the JVM. And you have this function absolute, which accepts some argument. We don't mention any types of arguments or return type. We assume that num has ABS function in it, and we can just run it. And of course, it will be fine for value minus one, but for a string value, it will crash. And if we would like to build the language that will be running on top of the JVM that will allow such code, how would we actually be able to do this? Um, there are a couple of workarounds that can be used and were used some time ago. For example, one of the workarounds is uh, to have some language specific type. This is how it would be under the hood. And then imagine we decompile it back to Java, right? So situation from the previous piece of code that I showed. Then maybe there will be some global type that will be your gut type of all your types. And then it will support all possible functions that any of your types in your language can support. And then you have to convert it to all the Java types and back and forth, and you have to handle all this. But it's really, really hard to do, like to think about all this possible situation in advance. And this is not, uh, it's not easy, and it's not really a nice solution. But it would, it would uh, do the thing. 
There are different workarounds, uh, like some other workarounds that involve reflection, some extra interpreters, but they proven to be quite slow. Uh, so yeah, but of course, these workarounds had to be used because there was no choice. Until uh, there was a new bytecode instruction introduced. It's not new now, but uh, it's been introduced in 1.7, but it was specifically introduced to support dynamically typed languages on top of the JVM. And invoke dynamic is yeah, a bit different from other functions that help invoke the methods. How is it different? For example, we have invoke virtual uh, that is meant for invoking virtual methods, so some method that belongs to some instance of some object. So this is piece of the bytecode uh, where we first need to put some uh, reference to that instance of that object onto the operand stack. Then we need to put all the arguments there as well, and then we can use this invoke virtual. But uh, as you can see, so it reference uh, it has a reference number 15, which refers to some place in the constant pool. But here, with the hint, we can see what exactly it's pointing to. So it's pointing to like the whole specification of all the types that you uh, that uh, this function or method accepts, for example, it is it accepts string and it returns v is void. And also the most important part here is, sorry, uh, the most important part here is that it will actually, um, we need to specify in which class exactly that function is located at, at the method. So we specify that this println method that is located in print stream class. So it's not something that we might know in advance for dynamically typed languages, so this is not very helpful. There is also invoke static instruction, so this is very similar. It's for the situations when, uh, in for invoking the static uh, method, and we of course don't need to put any reference to the object onto the stack, but we still need to put all the arguments. We still need to specify carefully all the types. So this is a very similar thing. There is also invoke special, invoke interface. Uh, okay, none of them was really as helpful as invoke dynamic. Why? Because okay, you still need to put all your arguments onto the operand stack and everything. But when you use invoke dynamic, you don't need to specify much. You specify only the types that the method will accept and what it will return. And you don't even uh, put the method name here. But this method name that is mentioned here is not exactly uh, the target method that will be invoked. It's something else. And there is a reference to a different section in the bytecode, which is called bootstrap methods. And uh, it's pointing to a bootstrap method. So the bootstrap method does some job at runtime. We specify what this method is exactly, where it's located, etc. It can accept a bunch of, uh, it accepts a lot of arguments. We can provide some of them uh, through this method arguments section, uh, also uh, through the bytecode. But some of them can be also filled in by inside of the JDK sources, like for this one specific example. And uh, how does it work when? Uh, JVM runs your bytecode, so it interprets instruction after instruction. It uh, finds this invoke dynamic instruction. It goes to this section, looks up this bootstrap method, invokes it. Bootstrap method can do any logic. It's basically like normal Java code that can be run. It can do any logic, but the, the ultimate goal is to find the method handle uh, of the target method. And this decision can be made at runtime. So this decision, this target method is looked up at runtime. It can also generate synthetic code, it can do many things. And then um, this target method gets linked to the specific invoke dynamic instruction. So under the same conditions, if we're running in a loop, for example, if we meet this invoke dynamic instruction again, we will not do all this bootstrapping logic again, we will uh, go directly to this target method and we will be invoking it again. And this was very helpful to support dynamically typed languages. It was really helpful, but I, w I had to talk about Java. I promised uh, to tell you about dynamic life of Java, right? So how is it relevant? Well, actually, Java compiler uses uh, invoke dynamic, like Java C places the invoke dynamic instructions in the bytecode as well, uh, more and more in recent versions. 
And uh, I want to show you a couple of examples where this is happening. For example, for string concatenation, uh, not for all cases of string concatenation. So when we concatenate constants, of course, they are optimized away into a single constant, etc. But for example, for this use case, there will be invoked dynamic instruction. When we have two variables and uh, in the bytecode, uh, we will uh, see this make concat with constants bootstrap method will be that method will be used we know that the method the target method that will actually perform the concatenation will accept two strings and return a string that's all we know when we actually at runtime hit this bootstrap method and this bootstrap method accepts as arguments uh, like a template where we put the placeholders for these two parameters this is what we have in the bytecode what is happening at runtime in the bootstrap method. So apparently for this use case, it, there is some faster implementation for this specific type of concatenation, the binary concatenation, when you have two elements that both are parameters, they're both non-primitive and non-null, whatever. And then it, it becomes a simple concat uh, use case, right? So there is a method handle that we're looking up somewhere in another place in the bytecode. Oh, sorry, not in the bytecode, in the JDK sources. And eventually it will bring us, uh, yeah, it has to find the method. The well, method handle is basically a reference to the method. Uh, it's uh, like uh, almost like reflection, but a bit more performance. So it's executable reference to the method that we will need to eventually get, right? And we're looking it by looking it up by type and by this name and eventually we will end up with this method that will be called and then okay it will perform concatenation for this specific use case which does it faster than maybe if we we'll execute the whole logic so at runtime we decide yeah we want to use this one it will accept two objects and return a string and do some uh, byte array manipulations as similar to string builder so this is one use case there is one more uh, actually more than one more and uh, there is pattern matching for switch this uh, in the newer version of java uh, where we can also switch through different types and we can have uh, the same type repeated multiple times as well with guard conditions etc uh, but for this use case in the bytecode we need to look up a target method that has one job it has to return an integer and that integer value helps the next instruction look up switch uh, to find location where to jump next. So all it has to do is return some integer value, but it makes the decision which value at runtime. And we provide as arguments all the types, like array of all the types that we're switching over. And then when the bootstrap method is invoked, it creates uh, like a chain of checks for every type creates like a global method handle and at runtime it makes these decisions based on this types that you provide through the bytecode. It might be uh, questionable why this is necessary to do it at runtime, but this actually is a lot of logic to put in the bytecode, so it's abstracted away and yeah, this becomes a uh, runtime decision-making logic. And I think the most exciting use case uh, when Invoke Dynamic is used in the a Java compiler is uh, lambdas because, okay, so when we implement, when we write a lambda, we're basically implementing the functional interface. So functional interface, the interface with one method that is not implemented. And we are basically saying here, for example, that in for each, uh, that the implementation of this functional, uh, of this consumer interface will be the println method. And what is happening at runtime, well, actually, like, let's look at the bytecode. So uh, in the bytecode, we specify which method exactly. So uh, in consumer, this is accept method, the one method that we need to implement. And in the end, this uh, target method that invoke dynamic finds will need to return the instances of this consumer. Then these consumer instances can be provided uh, to for each, for example, or anything else. So what is happening at runtime uh, when the bootstrap method uh, is invoked? It creates some synthetic code. It creates a class that implements consumer and it implements the accept method. 
and inside of this method body, it puts the whatever we specify in our lambda body. And in our case, it's the reference to uh, print align method. And there might be a use case when we have a bigger body, like a block of code, right? And then in this case, this whole block of code will be placed during compile time in a separate method in your bytecode. And then we will provide this reference to that method already as your uh, yeah, implementation of accept method in this case. So it becomes invoke dynamic every time it's hit here. It becomes it is a factory basically that returns you an instance of consumer that you can provide to next uh, instructions. Yeah, this I already mentioned. So to conclude, um, why is it good for Java to actually do this to make these decisions at runtime? There are a couple of considerations that I came up with. Uh, first of all, the Java logic is uh, the Java language logic is becoming more advanced with newer versions, and there is a lot of things that need to be uh, that, that need to be done, and it's good if they are not done in your bytecode. If your program code is not polluted, like with something that is not even related to your program exactly, so this logic gets abstracted away into some um, JDK sources, yeah, and this becomes your bytecode becomes less complex. It takes less space, but what is important if, uh, is that in newer Java versions, there might be some improvements of how these bootstrap methods work and what they find exactly, which methods they give you back. And you will not even need to recompile your code, but you will still benefit from any um, improvements that happen in the newer Java versions. But there is, of course, another consideration that maybe your program will become less predictable than you expect it to be because, for example, for string concatenation, maybe we are um, making it more performance but placing more instances of string on heap or there can be some trade-offs and you cannot fully know exactly how it will uh, end up. But I'm quite sure that uh, yeah, it's being considered and all these decisions are made mostly for the better. And uh, these are some interesting things to read. So on the left is the article that uh, dives deeper into the uh, dynamically typed languages on the JVM. I found it really interesting to read, so if you're interested in the topic you can take a look. On the right is my Medium blog because I like to write about JVM, so if you're curious you can take a look. And that was it, thank you.